Section 11 of Christmas and Christmas Lore. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Christmas and Christmas Lore by Thomas G. Crippen. Section 11. Christmas Tales. Notwithstanding these imaginary terrors, Christmas has long been accounted, in England at least, the most fitting season for ghost stories. Why this should be the case is a question that leads us into another interesting region of folklore. The proverb, Talk of the devil and he'll appear, embodies what was once an established article of belief, that to talk of malignant beings was to invite their approach, and perhaps give them power to do mischief. Yet there has always been a hankering to hear what might be told or dreamed about the night side of nature, and perhaps the possibility of danger may have whetted the edge of curiosity. It seems usually to have done so from the days of Eve and the serpent to those of Bluebeard and Fatima, but it was felt that the powers of darkness must be helpless in the presence of the Christ child. Moreover, in the Middle Ages, and far back into the mists of Christian antiquity, there was an idea that the events commemorated in the great Christian anniversaries were mystically repeated at those holy seasons. So the Savior was thought of as actually born at Christmas, manifested to the nations at Twelfth Tide, presented in the temple at Candlemas, fasting and tempted in Lent, triumphing on Palm Sunday, crucified on Good Friday, rising from the dead on Easter Sunday, ascending to heaven on Holy Thursday, sending down the Spirit at Pentecost, not literally, of course, but mystically, in such wise that the grace and power of those his saving deeds were specially localized, so to speak, in the corresponding anniversaries. When we put these two beautifully poetic thoughts together, we understand somewhat of the fitness of Christmastide for conversation about the shadowy side of the universe of being. At other times there might be danger in talking too familiarly of fiends, ghosts, and sprites that haunt the nights. But at Christmas the power of malignant spirits was so neutralized by the mystical presence of the Christ child that curiosity respecting them might be safely indulged. It is to this that Shakespeare alludes, where he tells us that Some say that ever against that season comes, wherein our Saviour's birth is celebrated. The bird of dawning singeth all night long, and then they say no spirit dare stir abroad. The nights are wholesome, then no planet strike. No fairy takes, nor which hath power to charm. So hallowed and so gracious is the time. Another tradition, which may well be counted as a Christmas tale, has to do with the gods of heathenism. The early Christians had no doubt in their real existence, not as gods, but as evil demons. And even earlier than the first clear mention of Christmas, we find a widespread belief that at the advent of the Savior there was a general collapse of the infernal dynasty. It was said that the demons whom the heathen had worshipped as gods, were then revealed in their true character, and the oracles which they formerly inspired became silent. Whether these oracles were in all cases pure imposture, or whether belief in them was grounded on obscure facts analogous to the alleged phenomena of modern spiritualism, is a question about which it seems prudent to be less dogmatic than were the men of the last generation. But however this may be, in Egypt, Greece, Italy, and elsewhere, the oracles had been accepted with unquestioning faith from time immemorial. In the age of the Caesars they began to be regarded with some degree of skepticism, while the Christians generally thought of them as real, but of diabolical origin. This opinion, together with a belief that they became unresponsive at the birth of Christ, survived until quite recent times. The words of Milton on this topic are well known. 
The oracles are dumb. No voice or hideous hum runs through the arched roof in words deceiving. Apollo from his shrine can no more divine with hollow shriek the steep of Delphos leaving. No nightly trance or breathed spell inspires the pale-eyed priest from the prophetic cell. Peor and Balaam forsake their temples dim with that twice-battered god of Palestine, and mooned Ashtaroth, heaven's queen and mother both, now sits not girt with taper's holy shrine. In vain the Tyrian maids their wounded Tamas mourn, and sullen Moloch fled, hath left in shadows dread, his burning idol, all of blackest hue, in vain with symbols ring, they call the grisly king, in dismal dance about the furnace blue, the brutish gods of Nile as fast, Isis and Horus, and the dog Anubis haste. Nor is Osiris seen in Memphian grove or green, trampling the unshowered grass with lowings loud, nor can he be at rest within his sacred chest. Naught but profoundest hell can be his shroud. In vain, with timbered anthems dark, the sable stolid sorcerers bear his worshipped ark. He feels from Judah's land the dreaded infant's hand. The rays of Bethlehem blind his dusky eyne, nor all the gods beside longer dare abide, nor typhon huge, ending in snaky twine. Our babe, to show his godhead true, can in his swaddling bands control the damned crew. All these tales of the olden time, but there is another class of Christmas tales which cannot be altogether ignored. For many years past, almost every popular serial has honored the festal season by a Christmas number, consisting for the most part of seasonable fiction. A very large proportion of these tales are of reconciliation of estranged kinsfolk, recognition of long-parted friends, return of errant sons or daughters, forgiveness of injuries, enmity subdued by the return of good for evil, or greed and selfishness expelled from the heart by the hallowed memories of the time, some few of these, like the immortal Christmas Carol of Dickens, have a permanent place in literature, but most of them are too plainly written to pattern, and are sadly lacking in originality. Nevertheless, the motive is usually commendable, and the feeblest of them are generally instinct with the true spirit of Christmas. End of section 11. Recording by John Brandon.